All right, we're going on today over Article 26 and System Concepts, The Path of Internal Power. Most people spend their lives aspiring to greatness, but settle for the mundane. They tend to blame their lack of success on external factors in their environment, such as wealth, people, fate, luck, genetics, upbringing, and location. Here's a quote. However, when we examine the acts of an individual, we shall find them compulsory. He is compelled to do them and has no freedom of choice. In a sense, he is like a stew cooking on a stove. There's no choice but to cook. And it must cook because providence has harnessed life with two chains, pleasure and pain. The living creatures have no freedom of choice to choose pain or reject pleasure. A man's advantage over animals is that he can aim at a remote goal, meaning to agree to a certain amount of current pain out of choice of future benefit or pleasure to be attained after some time. But in fact, there is no more than a seemingly commercial calculation here. Where the future benefit or pleasure seems preferable and advantageous to the agony they are suffering from the pain they have agreed to assume presently. There is only a matter of deduction here. That they deduct the pain and suffering from the anticipated pleasure. And there remains some surplus. Thus only the pleasure is extended. And so it sometimes happens that we are tormented because we do not find the attained pleasure to be the surplus that we had hoped for compared to the agony we suffered. Hence we are in a deficit, just as merchants do. When all is said and done, there is no difference here between man and animal. And if that is the case, there is no free choice whatsoever, but a pulling force, drawing them towards any bypassing pleasure and rejecting them from painful circumstances. And providence leaves them to every place it chooses by means of these two forces without asking their opinion in the matter from the article, The Freedom, by Bala Sulaim. At some point in their development, they are forced to face the glaring truth that they are powerless over their lives. They try to hide and suppress the, this conclusion by drugs, alcohol, food, vacation, entertainment, religion, or other distractions. If the feeling of emptiness intensifies, the distractions lose their potency. They find themselves stuck in their miserable existence. They might even contemplate their own demise. They search for meaning, but even that does not help them overcome their real problems. They might even try spiritual methods to reduce their sense of self. They want to annul to a higher force, a deity, teacher, or concept. However, this fails to make any significant change to their reality. The solution is to stop looking for external dependencies, but rather to focus internally on how we are subconsciously sabotaging our own success. We are afraid of prosperity because of the responsibility it requires of us. It is easier to complain about our failures than actually owning our experiences. The first step is to understand that we are in fact controlling ourselves indirectly. This leads us to having awareness of our self-manipulation. We observe ourselves from the side, watching how we respond to daily stimulus. Those discernments become the foundation for maturing our perception. We realize that the problem is not in our actions, but rather in our undeveloped cognizance. We lack the clean concepts and why we deserve to actualize our potential. And here's a quote. However, there is freedom for the will to initially choose such an environment, such books and such guides that impart to him good concepts. If one does not do that, but is willing to enter any environment that appears to him and read any book that falls into his hands, he is bound to fall into a bad environment or waste his time on worthless books, which are abundant and easier to come by. In consequence, he'll be forced into foul concepts that make him sin and condemn. He will certainly be punished, not because of his evil thoughts or deeds, in which he has no choice, but because he did not choose to be in a good environment. For in that, there is definitely a choice. Therefore, he who strives to continue to choose a better environment is worthy of praise and reward. But here too, it is not because of his good thoughts and deeds which come to him without his choice, but because of his effort to acquire a good environment which brings him these good thoughts and deeds. From the article The Freedom by Bala Sulam. Each step of the way is realizing that we hinder our own progress because of an innate fear of change. We need a strong and flexible environment to support and give us confidence. This will enable us to express ourselves in a constructive manner. 
Throughout our advancement, we experience emotional declines and high aspirations. We need to temper the extremes by dealing with the internal turmoil that we project on others. This is why a mutual environment is crucial to help us survive the onslaughts of our impulsive behavior. We need to expect rewards along the way to nurture our ego. These rewards manifest as perception changes towards maturity in the way we respond to situations. We have to be careful not to stagnate our progress by either over enjoying the rewards or falling into defensive behaviors over our achievements. And here's a quote. And then each and every one of us will be rewarded with intensifying his own internality, meaning the Israel within us, which is the needs of the soul, over our own externality, which is the nations of the world within us, that is, the needs of the body. That force will come to the whole of Israel until the nations of the world within us recognize and acknowledge the merit of the great sages of Israel over them and will listen to them and obey them. Also, the internality of the nations of the world, the righteous of the nations of the world, will overpower and submit the externality, which are the destructors, and the internality of the world, too, which are Israel, shall rise in all their merit and virtue over the externality of the world, which are the nations. Then all the nations of the world will recognize and acknowledge Israel's merit over them. From the introduction to the Book of the Zohar by Bala Sulam. The result of our internal state dictates our interaction with ourselves and others. We need to grow to a high degree of perception that will result in a substantive expression of our inner dialogue and conduct. This will give us power over our lives to mitigate the situations we encounter daily. When our internal sense of self is stronger than the pressure of our external environment, we will prevail in any situation we encounter. We will then be able to help others develop themselves accordingly. There is a very strict contingency that we must always focus on our own personal growth first. The results of our overabundant internal confidence will spill over into others. Many fail this preliminary requirement, seeking to help others before firmly securing their own self-worth. They prematurely jump to the conclusion that they have any meaningful self-love. It requires great diligence to be grounded in our actual state, not delude ourselves in frivolous fantasies. When we reach maturity of our perception, we will be able to focus all our energies on getting things done, instead of fighting ourselves every step of the way. We will reap benefits from our deep understanding of the structured mechanisms that manipulate our reality. Our involvement in this process will enrich our experiences and surprise us in how much our internal power can change the events in our lives. And here's the first workshop question. What is the root cause of our problems in life? Daniel. that we have immature concepts. So we are like blinded and, 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 our, and we don't have internal power and, and, and we don't realize that we don't have it and we don't realize that internal power is what is causing our, that the lack of internal power is causing our problems. Gabriel. Yeah, this is uh, is this uh, an alignment of uh, of uh, what we really desire and uh, what we think it's gonna fill us, uh, which is pretty much the concept of uh, <clears throat> that we what we actually need is internal power, but we we rather focus on any other thing and uh, stagnate our advancement. <clears throat> but yes, um. Maria. Sorry for the noise. Um, yes, I think initially we um, erroneously look to blame external and find a, a solution um, to our problems by blaming external factors when um, we will then realize that it's due to a lack of internal power. Uh, everything that we consider a problem is basically um, um, a manifestation that we don't have internal power to to actually affect those situations. Mary. And lack of uh, lack of immature concepts and that um, not understanding 
the system and how it works and uh, fighting with ourselves and, and internally um, and it manifesting externally, just our constant fighting uh, with ourselves. Next. Rosha. Uh, I would say uh, it's just, again, um, a lack of internal power in the situation. You know, if you would assign a number to a situation, the internal power needs to be higher than that number. You basically need to overtake that situation with internal power, and then it doesn't really even uh, seem as a problem at all. It's just showing you how much you, you, you need it. Uh, that's why that event takes place in the, in the first place. Rick. It's a combination of using our internal power, growing our internal power, along with our intention, which is we need to separate that internal power from our ego's control into our own control. So if you could have the largest cleave, but if you have no control over it, you have no internal power. So you must control the aim of this internal power. You must realize it as your internal power, that you are the one in control, the operator. Robin. I agree with what Robin said. The, uh, the biggest problem is not having internal power, not having control over our own lives. We, when we start out, we're just we, we look for filling, we look for anything to do or eat or whatever just to fill us, and that's not it. We need internal power to have control over that and control over the direction in your life and so on. Caesar writes, we don't have freedom of choice to choose pain or reject pleasure. The, the root cause of our problems in our life is that um, we are trying to be something we're not. We think that, the will, that we are the will to receive. And if that was the case, then we would be living like animals where they actually have, you know, if they've got, you know, a great environment, they're actually very happy with their lives. Um, uh, and the idea is that we have to uh, understand that we are not the will to receive and that we are not, um, we need power in our lives. We need the sensation of control. And that the idea is that um, even though it's an illusion, it's control, and we understand internally that there are internal power, the creator is controlling everything. We need that illusion. We live inside that illusion. And we need to align that illusion with what's really happening. So then we feel that we actually have control of our lives. And that manifests in alignment, where we see that situations are going away, and an expression that we uh, can dictate what's going to happen next and actually happens. So you could say pre-alignment. The second question, What is the solution for our situation, Daniel? Oh, wow. What is the solution for our situation? Well, the first step is to be in the environment that advertises us with the importance of internal power. I'm sure there are many Many, many more discernments uh, about it, but uh, uh, I want to hear the friends. Gabriel. The solution is to become the creator because then you're the cause, right? If, uh, if you saw, so. In the aftermath, then there's not really about it. But uh, when when it comes to a point where the, you're the one that it's, that that is the one creating, then you uh, just, uh, you would be happy, eternally happy. 
Maria. Well, I think there's a lot of steps to take, but um, first I have to, st uh, one has to stop blaming others for the situation because um, that's actually something that, in a that can be um, feeling good. It feels good to blame someone else because then I don't face the responsibility that what I'm experiencing is my fault or, or lack of my, my internal power. Um, but also this is a painful process. It can be painful to come to those terms. So I need a good environment. And uh, ultimately we will, um, from gauging where we're at and what, how much power we need to where we want to go, we'll, we'll help each other clean the concept. So basically I, I guess the first step is to realize there's nobody to blame out there. There's nothing that's going to be out there that's going to um, help me solve it because it's, it's an internal process. Mary. Uh, yes. The, the environment is the first thing you have to um, get yourself in the right environment with people who are cleaning concepts and learning about the system and um, trying to grow, spiritually grow and uh, learn from each other and, um, and help each other and support each other. Moshe. Um, just uh, basically understanding how the system works and uh, how the internality rules your externality, and it's all about cleaning your desires, cleaning your internality, and um, basically reaching uh, full adhesion with the creator. And that's basically the solution to any situation. Rick. It's getting in the environment and using your friends in the environment as a tool to help you move from whatever state you're in, whether you're feeling like you're stuck, whether you're in a deep descent or in a great ascent and you're feeling great. Uh, the thing is to know is always to seek your next state, the next place you're going to. And if you're not sure, then you need to get with your friends, get with those who have been in those states and find out what took them there. Always, always, always yearn for that connection. Yearn for that internal power, which is realizing that yourself is your future self, that you are in um, uh, a transition and moving towards that. And always keep that as your goal, that transition, that movement. Robin. Uh, now you have to get yourself your 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 sense of self, your security, all that, out of your corporeal life. You have to move into an environment that is aimed in that direction and has people in it that that aren't in that environment and you need the support and you need to make that transition into spirituality. You'll see. Coming to, to a place where you feel that there is no problem, therefore there's no solution needed. Um, how to get there uh, yeah, I could totally relate to what Rick said I think that the, the, the environment is extremely important uh, you can never I mean I don't want to say never but I would presume that almost never can do it on your own because at the end of the day you're stuck within your own mind with its own limitations and the group, if it's uh, focused on the same goal of reaching spirituality, of uh, crossing the barrier, or it doesn't matter what stage you're at, uh, that's the kind of environment you want to be in because it'll pull you back in the right direction, unlike many other uh, environments.
Caesar writes, stop looking for external dependencies, but rather internality on how we are subconsciously sabotaging our own success. Um, I definitely say that uh, the, the biggest solution is to find an environment that will help you clean concepts and um, will just, you basically allow them access into your internality to help you do the work since uh, we're at a situation today where our egos are so big that uh, they, they just don't allow us to actually do any real internal scrutinies. We can think that we're doing internal scrutinies, but at the end of the day, we, we just, we're stuck in circles. So we need an environment that can actually we allow them access into ourselves. We become vulnerable to them and allow, us, uh, allow them to help us clean our definitions of all different concepts that we, we didn't understand correctly. What is bestowal? What is egoism? How do we advance? What is our next step, etc. Third question, what is the process to reach the goal? Daniel. Uh, I don't know. If I knew it, I would already have reached it. Gabriel. Um, it's pretty much just a process of uh, realizing that we're the creator. And, um, taking that sense of self from the ego to the creator and realizing that all along, it's been right here. And um, pretty much um, taking the blind off of our eyes and uh, realize that, uh, yeah, there, there's nothing really to fight because everything is made for the glory of heaven. Therefore, um, <clears throat> Um, and realize that every situation it's just made for you to advance. Um, so adhering to the environment, it's it's ex ex crucial because it does really represent and can say what it show you what you what you're going through and uh, what has to be done in order for you to advance. So um, yeah, uh, be able to expose yourself really and uh, not be afraid of of see really what's inside of you because at the end that's all there exists Maria uh, yes and once you know where you're headed what's the goal then to to know that there's a process to it there's a, um, a system to it and uh, at the end of the day we want to hasten time so um, although um, we may at one point feel that we're being restricted by being told, look, this is exactly what's going to happen all the way step by step. Um, it's actually a good coordinate system that can help us and um, um, not only know what's heading, but heading our way, but also what to concentrate on. Because at the end of the day, if, we, if our desire is there, we want to always be working towards, okay, well, what's next? What's next? What, have to, what do I have to be working? Now that I know that it's not external, fine. Now internal, where do I focus on? So it's, it's good to have that. It's not, limit, it's not something that limits one, but it's actually something that really helps us uh, go through what we need to go through and even though it's hard or whatever but we have the environment so um yep that, that's what i have Thanks. mary uh and um uh, constantly making discernments um sticking to the environment supporting each other and um asking for help when you need it and studying uh working with your individual um you know, getting together to clean concepts and um, encourage each other and stay focused on um, the next state. Uh, but discernments, 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 you know, you just have to keep at it. Moshe. Right. Um, basically, as far as discernments, it's, it's the same with every goal that you're trying to attain. It's all about having a goal and then having discernments on that goal. Um, and it's basically, it's just cleaning the desire, cleaning, making, uh, seeing the details. And uh, uh, that's basically how you uh, reach any goal. Rick. The process to reach the goal is first to set the goal and make it very clear within yourself what the goal is. The next thing is to start taking steps 
and the system that you're involving yourself with. In this case, in system concepts, once you've set your goal, now you must start work, working the process, reading the articles, looking back at the videos when you have opportunities, going and talking to those who have preceded you, speaking to those who have attainment and seeing what they can share with you, always reaching for the next step, the next degree, the next state. This is the process. If you keep this up, no matter what happens, no matter if you plateau 50,000 times, if you work at this constantly, you will reach your goal and hasten time. Robin. Yes, you have to know where you are, and you have to know where you want to go, and you have to keep that desire constant to keep advancing. You have to know, and you have to want internal power so badly and use the environment, and I don't know, everything has been said. I, I can't remember everything. You'll see. First of all, define yourself a goal. Make sure it's clear. Get as many discernments on it as you can. And I think that's pretty much it. Jenny writes to add, desiring only to attain total adhesion, absolute internal power. With this, all will be provided for your advancement. Expect it. And Caesar wrote, is to understand that we are in fact controlling ourselves indirectly. This leads us to have awareness of our self-manipulation. We observe ourselves from the side watching how we respond to daily stimulus. Um, the process uh, definitely is always having a goal and understanding how we can use our environment to reach that goal. So it's constantly, uh, you've got the goal which is in yourself and then you go outside of yourself to the environment to uh, collect discernments, experiences, emotions that will fortify and actually help you reach that goal. And that process is a continuous, where you start with yourself, you have the environment in the middle like a sandwich, and then you return to yourself and this is constant breathing and breathing out motion. This article was uh, written for phase one for humanity, and that's why if you take out the quotes, um, there's no religious words, no mention of the creator. We uh, basically used uh, synonyms to uh, find uh, normal, egoistic, uh, humanity uh, words, definitions for spiritual concepts. And uh, you think it's, it's possible to make the take it the the public from the transition of uh you know the people have con what's outside of me it's what's having control over me you know the people around me the situation what's having control to directly i am the one in control or is it necessary to take you uh, like all of us like from you know everything outside of me is controlling me to them attribute that to the creator as something outside of me but at least everything comes from one point and then start the process to act and internalizing all of that can you go directly from and skip the the creator part so one of the things that we're trying to check is is that possible is it possible to skip the phase two and go directly to the internet to the phase three since phase three includes phase two within it right because if you remember phase three is including both the bestowal aspect and the receiving aspect receiving internal power and using the environment which is that bestowal part so um, I guess we'll see from experience if that's possible. Do we actually have to reach the point where we uh, um, work on fortifying the creator as something external and then afterwards changing the direction? Um, so far, it seems like it might actually work, but uh, I guess we'll see from experience if it actually happens. Perhaps this would uh, 
help uh, people aim themselves correctly. If actually, I mean, I, I find that that helped me up um, to aim myself correctly, uh, and at least to know that the end, the end goal is lishma, uh, and everything that I would do is is in order to to really reach that goal. And in the main process, I know I know what my reasons are, but I but yet I still. I'm still aligned to, to wanting to, to achieve this for the creator's sake. And I just, uh, I'm, you say I'm able to, to include everything in that process, not just uh, wanting to single out things and say, this is, this is good for me and this is not good, or they, you know, this comes from a creator and this does not come from a creator. And that's something I, I would say that people would uh, struggle a lot because they're the, sometimes it's just impossible to attribute things that happen, you know, to, to yourself. So if without having this concept of something that is, that, you know, it's obvious that it's super powerful, you know, like the creator that is supposed to have control over everything. I don't know how good people like get over that to go directly through that transition. If we look in any, any profession, we've always got um, the people that deal with the source, like for example, scientists, um, and then we've got the consumers. And then you have people in the middle which do the mediating between the scientists and the consumers, like, for example, doctors. Right? Doctors don't actually create the, the, me the medicine. What they do is they do the mediation between the people that supply the medicine, which are the scientists, right? and the people that are going to consume the medicine, which are the patients. Right? So the idea is we're trying to do the same thing here. Kabbalah is written in a scientific language. And the idea is that that's not designed for end consumers. So the books are spread, but, but basically the, the people that read them are either going to read them and ignore the knowledge and just use it as some kind of catalyst for reforming light or something like that, or uh, they're going to be scientists and actually read it and deduce and understand the structure and intelligence of it. Um, and they are called the, uh, the, the doctors. Right? They're, they're, they're not the scientists, they're the doctors. And then the idea is what they can do, they can uh, translate it or put it in a language that can actually uh, appease to consumers, to people that just want to get their lives better, to get things done. They don't want to start dwelling into the structure of creation and understanding all the different uh, you know, um, switches and understandings and manipulations of letters and stuff. They don't want to have to do that. They just want, they have a problem they don't control, have control of their lives and the solution is to give them control of their lives and they want a very clear cut uh, solution and they don't want to have to spend years and years of dwelling into the books right for anything to actually become substantially included into humanity it has to be applicable to them it has to be presented to them right and as we've seen in anything like computers once they became easier to use then they became to more consumers you know, in the beginning, you had to, you know, either write your own kernel or, you know, write command line commands and stuff like that. And today, it's just a click of a button. So the idea is that uh, the more, um, the easier it is to use, the more you can uh, help more people. So the idea is that uh, people like us, which are learning uh, um, you know, system concepts or learning Kabbalah materials, we will basically become the mediators for the public and actually give them a sustainable solution that they can actually improve their lives without having to learn all the structure. And could they also achieve the same connection to the greater assets? So they'll have the connection, but it will be um, uh, with, with less knowledge involved. It'll be more of a sen sensation uh, connection and less of a mind connection. That is, they might not know all the reasons and all the structure to it, but it'll actually work for them. And I guess it's, this is when it comes out with Israel lights into the nations and you know, with a rush. So exactly. It is the Israel the ones who actually understand the mechanisms and then the nations are the ones that actually get supplied with practical uh, applications to their daily lives. Um, I'm going to mention, I hopefully you can hear with background noise, um, this question that Daniel just posed about um, point in the heart. It seems that that term 
has kind of evolved a bit. When I think about um, that practice client that I have, um, and that question regarding whether or not she has one, I would say based on um, our past conversations and her development to this point, the point in the heart seems to be more of, for her now, the desire for that adhesion, um, but more so in the, in the, the reference of power understanding what that power means. So it's almost as if point in the heart from phase two is more of a unity, our root, but at our point, at our, at our level, it instead becomes the desire for that adhesion or that internal power. And so not that she's skipping phase two, but that she didn't uh, remain in that unity aspect, even though she recognizes that everything outside of her is really her inner internality. It's definitely, um, I remember when we were working on the phases, at the beginning we thought the point in the heart arrives in the beginning of phase two. And then uh, through additional experience, we found out that the, the point in the heart, the passive point in the heart, actually starts at 1.3. It starts at the religious phase, right? when people are actually looking for uh, the meaning of life. They're looking for, uh, and, and it represents itself in a passive manner because the meaning of life is where you want to uh, um, accept your reality, know why it's happening to you. And, uh, um, and then and therefore have that acceptance. Acceptance is a passive way of power. And then afterwards, when it continues to grow and reaches that active point in the heart, which is 2.3, then you actually want actual control. You want actual uh, power in your life. It's no longer you just want to be told why it's happening to you. So there are many places that, you know, they'll tell you, oh, the reason it happened to you because in your previous reincarnation, you were a terrible king and you were nasty to your servants. And that's why you're being screwed in this life. And the person would, in a passive point in the heart would be like, Oh, oh, that's why, oh, now I feel better because now I know why I'm being screwed. Um, with an active point in the heart, that's not enough for you. You say, that's very nice, but how do I actually change the situation? How do I improve my life? Like, who cares what happened to my previous reincarnation? What I care is how can I improve my life now and improve it in my day-to-day -day life, not just know why things are happening, but actually change things for the better. Right, and ultimately that's, um, that's her goal. She recognizes that if, if it is that we discussed, especially today, um, that that's definitely worth her while. Um, yep. It is remembered that even, even when phase two talks about unity and connection, mutual guarantee, they're not actually talking about what happens outside of the group or outside of the society. They're actually only talking about in the society. They make it sound like they're actually wanting to reach unity and connection with people outside of the society. Um, but when you actually delve into it, you actually find it's not true, that they're actually talking about connection inside the society. And they're saying, don't change what is happening outside. Like people come in to the society and their immediate first response is, oh, should I be nice to people at work? Should I change my behavior at work? And the response will always be from the Rav that no, keep uh, acting as a normal human being and don't be overly nice to everyone um, because they'll take advantage of you. So we see by that that even phase two in implementation isn't actually involved in suddenly improving the world and going out to Africa to help children or to go to the needy and deal with the poor. Rather, it's actually only dealing with the group dynamic itself and uh, um, allowing the friends to work with you. And it's more working in that dynamic and not in going to improve the, the lives of the needy in the world. So we see that, the, that that is why phase two is incorporated in phase three. Because it's not about that for years you have to go out and help people, the needy in the world, and then you can only work on your internal connection and alignment. No, you can go straight to the group, jump straight to the group and work with them on uh, allowing them, giving them the vulnerability factor to allow them to actually clean your concepts and improve your life accordingly. 
So one doesn't need a group uh, spiritual society. Like like one can jump directly to like as Jenny's doing with her client. What I've seen from experience is um, even if someone doesn't have a uh, a real spiritual society, they still need some kind of source of knowledge that will provide for them dirty concepts. So the whole idea of the spiritual society of phase two is to actually provide a person dirty concepts um, or reveal to him a dirty concepts that he already has. Right? So it's not that they have to say nonsense. They just have to say things in an abstract way that the person will continue to understand it the way he currently understands it. And then phase three can clean those concepts that has been revealed to him. So the whole point of phase two is just to reveal concepts within him. And then phase three can actually work on cleaning them. And that's the revelation of evil. Revelation of evil is revelation of immature concepts within the person. And then you can go with that to the group and actually clean those concepts in advance. Let me tell you that evil is not only concepts, it also becomes emotional concepts too. Like it's really tangible. And, and that for that, for things like that to happen, you actually need interaction with people and actually expose, you know, try to, you know, make an effort to connect. And that's when you go, oh, I don't want to connect. So um, we really have talked about this. Will, in the future, a physical, actual group be needed? Um, who knows? There might be a chance that we'll be able to provide such powerful uh, virtual experiences for a person that could replace the need for actual people to interact with each other. Because at the end of the day, all you're seeing is responses in your five senses, and you're not actually interacting with anything else. So it is if a good uh, dynamic experience was provided to a person, let's say through you know, a virtual experience, um, he might not have to actually interact with physical people. Um, but I guess we'll see what happens with that in the future. Yeah, they still about it. Just make you feel either way. Um, Currently, there uh, is no uh, solution. Currently, you need there's only you need to interact with actual people. Um, and but the idea is the, the reason I say this is to understand it's not about oh I'm connecting with other souls and we're all connected internally. Scrap that. It's more about the concept. It really is about cleaning concepts, and we use other people to have that dialogue to clean our concepts. And we do this with phase two passively. So we just basically reveal bad concepts inside of us. Then with the group, it's more an active process. And then finally, uh, with the individual, that's an intensive process. We're actually working on like, how do you actually understand it? Working on cleaning like the actual gritty ditty, uh, details in the concepts and not just in a general way. So even in the group, it's still in a general way. So we talk about a lot of details, but they don't apply to each person specifically for their issue. And with individual, you work on that uh, with another individual on your specific scenarios, situations, and experiences. How does seeing me seeing my reactions from the side, how the creator uh, governs me, how does it help me advance? Well, what it does is that part of your problem in life is that you, you don't know First of all, you don't know how you actually work. You don't know your processes. You don't understand the, the structure and your thought process and how you sabotage yourself. So the idea is the first to look at the side and see how you're actually sabotaging yourself and that you are, um, through experiences, uh, let's say, for example, you have a positive experience and then immediately you have a negative experience. It's probably because in that positive experience you felt that you didn't deserve it. And then subconsciously you sabotage your negative experience so it'll be a negative one. And then you're like, oh, okay, so life is normal. Now, you know? I'm like everybody else. I, I suffer like everybody else. And it is to reach a point where you, if you understand those processes, then you can actually start making a change in them. You can start cleaning. Who says I don't deserve it? Maybe I am the most deserving person on this earth. Maybe I do deserve a better life. Who says I don't? And so forth. And you clean those concepts. And then your thought process changes and your emotional process changes as well. And then you actually start sabotaging yourself and actually aligning yourself and actually having a great life. Uh, 
um, the, the spiritual society, the reason why it's phase two and religions um, are not phase two, is uh, religion deals with taking spiritual knowledge and then corporalizing it and turning it into rituals, um, physical actions that need to be done. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's with others. The idea is that the focus is on the ritual part of the issues and the 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 day-to-day -day activities that have to be done with your hands, feet, and mouth, right? The physical actions, and that's why it's phase one. It's humanity. It's basically taking spiritual concepts and corporalizing them, physicalizing them, for using your physical body with, right? That's why religion is phase one, not phase two. In the spiritual society, there you're doing. Um, human interaction, but not for uh, the corporalizing part. You're doing it to uh, as a as a uh, as a pre step for a more deeper connection of actually claiming concepts. So the phase two is a stepping board for phase three. But in phase two, it starts with the human interaction, right, around the, the spiritual knowledge, not in order to corporalize it. That's not the goal, which is the goal of religion. Rather, the goal is to actually allow you to reach adhesion and reach it not through corporeal actions, but rather through uh, connection, mutual guarantee, and in the end, breach phase three, which is cleaning concepts. Isn't it uh, true that a person, like I'm thinking of my client, she's not going to join Bani Baruch, but um, my goal is to help her um, function so that she can get through a phase two. and Am I wrong in thinking that uh, in her beginning knowledge of the of the spiritual aspects, that in in uh, looking at her externality as her um, and her feeling responsible for that, isn't that a phase two uh, level that she can work with initially? The idea is you never have to force anyone to anything. The idea is that. Um, if someone, uh, you know, I work with people at work, for example, there's no society, there's no group even, it's just me working on them individually. Um, the idea is that you can advance them to some level, but in the end you'll find out that what's limiting them is that they need some other source to expand their knowledge and understanding and actually bring questions forward. And that's why uh, sending someone, for example, to read a book, let's say, uh, of let's say Rav, like Pathika a great book, um, or Attaining the Worlds Beyond. What that does is then the person come back to you and say, what does this mean? What does that mean? How do I understand this? And then that actually becomes, the book is actually a, a you could say, a replacement for phase two, since it imparts to you in a passive way. Remember that the society is a passive experience. It's not an active experience. You don't have to actually talk with anyone. For years in BB, there was no actual human interaction. There was meals and, and they didn't talk to each other in that. And there was the lessons, you definitely don't talk to each other in that. There were no workshops, remember? So phase two is just a passive experience of listening to the Rav at the end of the day. Sitting together, listening to the Rav. And the idea is you can listen to Rav either um, through a book, right? Because at the end of the day, most of his books are basically his lessons written in words. So you could either read it through the books or through video, audio, or even live uh, uh, situations. But the idea is that you can, uh, the idea of phase two is to give a person a, uh, a general um, like uh, coverage of different concepts. And then afterwards you can work with the individual, with the group to actually clean them and, and apply them to his understanding and clean his concepts. So the idea of phase two is just to give that initial load of knowledge and then the group can work with that knowledge to actually clean it and apply to them uh, as individuals. So that, that makes sense. Then attaining the world, I, um, I can understand how that would be uh, one that would be beneficial for her. And then maybe uh, chaos to harmony because that's more of a corporeal aspect. Um, and then to help her because she's going to come to a point where thinking, well, that's, that's all I have to do. I have to... Uh, you know, give to my society or I have to be altruistic and then help her recognize the next level of, well, we really don't have the capacity to do that yet because we're egoistic. 
Uh, and then I can see how the phase three can then come in and help clean those. Exactly. So the idea is you can actually, uh, with a strong individual, you can actually get the person through all the process, but you still need some kind of body of knowledge to actually uh, get them to realize how they're actually dirty in their concepts. So it's first revealing to them they're evil, which means revealing their immaturity of their concepts. And only then can you actually clean it. You can't clean someone's concepts if they don't think there's any dirty concepts. Yeah, exactly right. Um, in fact, that actually came up today because she was talking about how she likes to really give certain types of support. She works in the schools and, uh, and how it, you know, really, it, it, you know, it's helping them. And she, you know, she does this on her lunchtime. And I, and I explained to her, so, well, you realize that's uh, very egoistic of you. And she says, no way. So I explained to her how it was. And she still made the funny face. And, um, but I know she's working on digesting it all. The idea is to basically have a lot of patience and, uh, and it, it can take time. I remember when I was working with someone for months, there was just no response. And then suddenly, after a few months, suddenly something changed and there was a sort of running after me to clean concepts one after the other. What's, what's really benefited the situation, however, is because we worked prior to me ever bringing any of this into it, um, I helped her um, really utilize the same kind of process in that I helped her um, focus on a particular goal, is corporeal, um, and said, now watch how things will begin to uh, fall into place or get rearranged or your environment will shift a bit as you um, keep this as your target. And so she's done that very well. And so she's pretty uh, shocked to see how much her environment has now begun to shift so that she is uh, um, actually working closer to that goal, to that aim. And so today I said, well, now your new goal or your new aim is internal power. And I explained that to her. And um, I said, you know, keep your corporeal things in place, what you're doing. But now this is your aim and this is your discernment. And so she understood that. And she, because she's already had success with just the corporeal goal, uh, she's very excited about this new goal. And it's, and it's very important. That's why it says that Lolishma, which was working for a corporeal goal, it is always require, a prerequisite, a requirement before reaching the Shema, which is where you have a spiritual goal. So it is, and it says, you, you know, never expect a point where someone will be able to work for a spiritual goal directly. They always have to go through some kind of corporeal goal first because it gives them something tangible to actually see success in, and then they can move on a higher desire, which is a spiritual goal. I think we'll continue to see uh, a lot of more success with phase one. Um, again, by cleaning the concepts and using phase one uh, words like instead of saying the creator use internal power it's the same thing but internal power is something more egoistic that can uh, register in a normal person um, the same thing is instead of using the word bestow it's control instead of using the word evil it's immature using good is mature so instead of saying God is good that does good that means he's it's a mature state a higher upper state of maturity and then when you get there you can mature others and help them clean their concepts accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, the, the terms are important. Um, I generally say the system and an adhesion with the system, and then I show with my fingers together like a, a flow in the adhesion in the, in the system, and that works for her. But, she, you know, she's still, she's Catholic, so, and she doesn't feel a, a threat with any of that at all. She understands that it's a science, like the law of gravity. Exactly, and that's why um, I also use, um, when I talk to Facebook people, I talk, is the word like system because it doesn't have a anthropomorphizing uh, um, um, part to it. So part of the problem is that when we normally think of the creator, we start turning it into a person with a thought process, with an understanding that we can actually have a conversation with. And the idea is it. It's, it's a system. You're living in the system. You're part of the system. You are the system. And um, the idea is to deal with it on a more scientific level in the end, actually to feel emotions about that science but not to anthropomorphize it. Right, I think we'll stop here and enter the after party.